Well, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to our, our webinar today, which um, we are collaborating with uh, MLA College. Um, you know, the subject of the webinar is going to focus on maritime sustainability and global trade. Um, we've all seen you know, recent pressure um, on, on supply chains globally, and um, one uh, event that actually amplified that and, and really brought it home to roost was the grounding of um, Evergreen, uh, uh, given, Ever, given, which was part of Evergreen, um, which was um, run, run to ground on in the Suez Canal and uh, closed the Suez Canal. Um, and this had a big impact on shipping. And it also highlighted the, you know, the fragile situation of the of global markets when you have a, a massive event like that. Um, I mean, approximately 12% of global trade passes through mm. the canal um, and the blockage held up, you know, almost $10 billion worth of, uh, of goods each day, which was a, a massive amount. Um, and this is, you know, supported by Lloyd's List. They provided the data. So it's, it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's all been validated. So um, all this occurs at a time when, you know, as I said earlier, uh, supply chains are still struggling to cope with the effects of, um, of COVID um, and struggling to affect the UK, the effects of, um, of, of Brexit. And, um, you know, we are uh, talking now based in Turkey. Um, fortunately, we did sign a, a free trade agreement with Turkey at the end of December. So uh, we do have continuity with Turkey and, um, you know, we're still able to operate um, with the same terms and conditions, almost all the same terms and conditions as we previously enjoyed when we were still part of uh, the EU. So during this webinar, um, MLA College CEO, Dr. Bashak Akdemir and uh, College Rector, Professor John Chudley will discuss how such developments can affect global trade and reflect on the real cost implications in the context of maritime sustainability. And sustainability is very much, you know, high on the uh, agenda globally, no matter what area you're in, um, whether it's business, whether it's it's um, uh, civil society, whether it's, you know, areas that um, in, on climate change and uh, green issues, um, you know, sustainability is the, is the key issue there. And, um, you know, we were, we're coming up to uh, COP26 um, this year um, up in Glasgow in November, where uh, Boris Johnson will lead you know, the uh, COP26 um, uh, conference on, um, on, on climate change and, um, and a green agenda. So focusing on commercial aspects, it's important that you know, we do learn the lessons um, and should be reflected in, in maritime sustainability context because you know, there's probably um, more uh, goods shipped um, by sea uh, around the globe than probably any, any other channel. So um, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, Bashak and, uh, and John will enlighten us as to you know, just what, what, what that means. So uh, sustainable development goals, um, which you know, were adopted by member states. Um, the UN uh, created this initiative and it is moving forward with a, a pace now as, um, you know, we're looking at how different countries will engage and embrace um, uh, the sustainable development goals for, for their respective markets. So um, I'm not going to say any more. Um, I'm going to leave it to the experts and um, I'm sure you'll benefit immensely from their experience and knowledge and the information that they will impart. So uh, I'm handing over to uh, Bashak to make the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the very nice introduction. I would like to share my slides. Well, thank you everyone. Today, Professor Chadley and I will be talking about maritime sustainability and global trade, uh, especially after uh, the ever given. So I'd like to start by maritime geography. So geo or graphen coming from Greek actually means earth writing. 
So the word geography is actually is the study of uh, it's di Earth's uh, diverse environments, places and surfaces and their interactions. And it actually seeks to answer the questions why things exist as they are and where they are. And uh, historically, this could only happen uh, by uh, war and trade. Whether through colonization or commerce, the notion of maritime transport became central to human so social development. And key to, to the trade were the cargoes being exported that flowed from one part of the world to another. So even now, surveying those patterns tell us a huge amount about the main countries and ports from which this, this cargo is exported and to which it is imported. So when we do this, we make this assumption is that there is a free movement of goods with no physical or political obstructions. But however, we all know that's not true. So physical conditions. So there is weather, waves, currents, tides, and access, availability of canals like Suez, global politics, political and economic change, piracy. Right now, even as we speak today, how safe is any given route? Environmental, what are the consequences of major environmental damages? So these are all important considerations for successful maritime industry. So um, approximately 70% of the Earth's surfaces is covered by water. And the remainder forms the seven continents, large continents, uh, large continuous discrete masses of land, largely separated by the oceans. Only actually Antarctica and Australia are wholly separated. So vessels do not just navigate oceans. Canals are also very important for international trade. And the Suez Canal would be a good example of this. Another key element is the use of rivers or lakes. For example, the Amazon in South America. So we think of it as a river, but it's actually where a lot of huge trade takes place. So when we talked about the Yangtze River in China or the Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. So Suez Canal is an artificial sea level waterway in Egypt, and it connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. It, uh, it was built by Ferd Ferdinand Marie, a French diplomat formed, who's formed the Suez Canal Company for the purpose of building this canal. So the construction lasted 10 years from 1859 to 1869 and took place under the regional authority of the Ottoman Empire. So when it was first built in the year 1869, it was only 164 kilometers long, but more importantly, 80 meet, eight meters deep. So over the years, it's been developed. So while in 1956, only a 30,000 deadweight ton or a 35 feet container could pass, by 1980s, this reached to Cape size vessels, 150,000 toners, and by 2001, 210 deadweight tons. And uh, uh, now after 2010, 240,000 deadweight tons vessels can uh, sail through Suez. So since 2010, it is 193 kilometers, 24 meters deep. So uh, maximum vessels of 240,000 deadweight tons uh, with 60 feet uh, maximum of 66 feet, feet draft can uh, sail through Suez Canal. So uh, if you think about it, unless you choose as an operator or an owner to pass through Suez Canal, you have to sail through all uh, the coast of Africa. And uh, if you look at uh, from Rotterdam to Singapore, uh, you can see the nautical miles uh, added to your journey. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, world trade. 
Well, uh, shipping carries more than 90% of the world trade uh, because uh, they are uh, they have superiority over all other forms of transport, especially when it comes to carrying large quantities because they are cost effective, efficient, clean and safety. So uh, when, when we are actually sitting in our homes and or in our offices when you are listening to me you are uh, because if you're under a roof you are it has been carried by a vessel either the cement or the steel the coffee you drink in the mornings or the computers or mobile devices you are listening to this is also traded it's or its parts is traded by vessels so when i say it's the uh, um, most cost effective way, it only costs three pence to the two and a half pound cost of cup of coffee to transfer the coffee by vessels. And it costs 20p to the five pound cost of a bottle of wine or uh, $5 to the hundred dollar cost of a Nike trainer. So the, the world seaborne trade has been uh, growing over the years. And uh, even uh, during pandemic, we even though during the pandemic we did see a huge stop. Today we are seeing um, a lot of activity. Another way to uh, predict uh, the global economy is always to look at the uh, maritime markets because they always reflect the reality of what's happening uh, in the world. So when we talk about world seaborne trade, we are talking about 11.4 billion tons of cargo carried by. 2 billion dead weight tons of fleet. So when we talk about this cargo, one thing I would like to mention is the majority of this cargo is the major bulk, so like coal, iron ore. And you can see that um, it's, uh, you can see also growing uh, number of containers. It is 15% of this trade is now done by containers. And uh, if you look at the, um, the vessels, supply of vessels that are transporting, you see that, uh, again, bulk carriers are majority and other vessels are only 23% um, of the whole world fleet. Uh, so what is the impact of Suez Canal on uh, today's world trade? So, um, so it is definitely a vital trade arter artery for our world. So every day around 50 vessels sail through the Suez Canal instead of going through the um, uh, wrong route, uh, long route. And uh, around 12% of the global trade passes through the Suez Canal. And uh, this is roughly $10 billion worth of trade that pass through the route each day. So if you look at uh, daily average, averages number of the vessels, you can see uh, the impact of um, COVID, how it came down, but again, it's uh, picking uh, up. So it is around roughly 50 vessels uh, per day. And uh, so roughly half of the tonnage that uh, use the Swiss Canal, that uh, choose to pass through the Swiss Canal is container ships, followed by tankers, bulk carriers, and the others. So, um, motor vessel ever green, ever given. So uh, actually, I believe ever given symbolizes the problems many supply chains are facing after a year long pandemic. Um, the, the blockage of Suez Canal, uh, follows the cascades of events that jeopardize the smooth running global uh, trade. So just five days after the uh, ever, ever green, ever given Renegade round, a fire at Renaissance Electronics, which is the world's largest makers of chips for the automotive industry located at north of Japan, uh, threatened further disruption of, to the semiconductor industry which were already feeling shortages. So the shortage, which uh, the shutdown, which was expected to last at least one month, uh, came right after their rivals, uh, NXP semiconductors and their German rivals, Infineon, uh, had to, uh, were, they were forced to shut uh, their chip uh, manufacturing uh, factories in Austin, Texas. 
for a month after the massive blackouts uh, the U.S. state um, caused by the Arctic blast. And they had just recently opened when this um, happened. So this reminds us of uh, the, the Japan's 2011 earthquake and uh, tsunami, which almost brought um, car factories to a uh, halt. Uh, and this went all the way to the US. So this time around, uh, I believe it has another potential uh, massive impact on global supply chains. So uh, this Arctic blast in Austin, Texas, it stopped four fifths of Texas's petrochemical production. So affecting supplies of polyethylene, polypropylene and polyvinyl chloride, so the three most important polymers. So these are all used in cars, uh, like uh, mostly in uh, air, airbags and other things. So, and uh, since the beginning of the um, pandemic, container shipping rates have more than tripled. So uh, today it costs around $4,000 to ship a 40 feet container between East Asia and US West Coast, whereas this was only $1,500 just at the start of 2020. So please remember, supply chains are based on predictable scenarios. So um, we had not anticipated, I don't think anybody anticipated the extreme scenario with an unprecedented crisis like the COVID-19 and the unique challenges that it is throwing at us. So global supply chains are facing three different pressures that are worth thinking about. So the first one I will call the push because it was it was most strongly, of course, articulated by the former U.S. President Donald Trump. So by saying to bring the jobs uh, home. Then uh, the second one is the COVID-19, the, the strategic reliance on the countries for medical equipment, for PPTs, for, for basic goods and key military and key civilian technologies that also, again, every country tried to back the production back to their own countries and uh, demand led by institutional investors and consumers for businesses to get a better grip over the supply chains. Now we are talking about imposing extra co uh, costs to the companies as maneuvered into policing carbon emissions, which we'll speak in a minute, and labor practices in other supply countries. So if we go back to the 1990s and even early 2000s, uh, global commerce was growing um, at twice the rate of the outputs because big economies like China, India, and um, East uh, European countries, they were just being integrated into the global economy. Now they have been more or less ab absorbed and I believe it's only natural for things to close down. Now we have uh, academics calling uh, globalization, slovabilization, slob which I do not agree. Today, uh, there are certain parts of the world that have not really been integrated. If you look at Africa, Africa has only been integrated up to two, maximum 3% of the global trade. So there is a plenty of scope uh, for integration of African and other poor countries into the system. And uh, I believe actually far from being exposed as fragile, uh, global, sub uh, global supply chains have repeatedly shown their um, abilities to respond to temporary disruptions and uh, structural shifts. So if you think about back in 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, oil prices more than doubled in less than two months. Today, that would not happen. Because supply has expanded. Supply is global. There is a connectivity between markets. Different kinds of oil terminals and refineries. Also today, there is the flexibility of refineries to handle different categories of oil. 
if you even think about the internet that allows millions of people who would previously had to travel uh, to meet over digital networks, that's how much we have adapted and we have changed. So um, Director General of the World Trade Organization said, if you really look at what is happening objectively, you will see that supply chains have been pretty resilient. And I very much believe this is thanks to the 1.6 million seafarers who are key workers that have been working in very difficult conditions during this pandemic. So but probably one of the people who got most affected are the seafarers because it has made it almost uh, come to stop of transferring. So uh, usually today um, the crew spends four to five months in a vessel and then they come home for two months and they go back. And if you think about an average vessel having 20 to 26 crew and as you can imagine, they don't change at the same day, they change in intervals. So there is a lot of crew change that's happening simultaneously around the world in the world fleet. So that had to come to stop because uh, even today as we speak, seamen are not allowed to even forget about setting foot in port. In If you arrive in China, they are not allowed to go even on the deck of the vessels. So seafarers are key workers. We, we should be grateful to them. Without them, we would not have continued our lives as we can do right now. So they are not just today, but I think every day are key workers. So uh, motor vehicle Evergreen. Uh, I know you all read a lot about it on the news. It is, uh, it looks small here, but it is a very big vessel and uh, it is uh, as tall as the Empire State Building. So it has, its length is 400 meters and uh, it is a 219,000 uh, that weight ton vessel. So uh, when it got stuck on Suez Canal, they had to stop for a week uh, to remove uh, the vessel. And even within hours, you can see number of vessels uh, that started uh, accumulating uh, in the Gulf of Suez, in both ends of the Suez Canal. So. Uh, when this happened, when uh, um, Evergreen grounded, global supply chains were already, already under huge pressure due to COVID-19. And as soon as this happened, Brent crude oil increased 6% in price. And by the afternoon of the incident, there were already 13 million bar barrels of crude and petroleum, uh, petroleum product shipments backed up at the boat entrances of the Suez Canal. So apart from crude following, flowing from Middle East to Europe and North America, today it has become a large transit route for, for oil from Russia to Asia. And shipping companies immediately began rerouting their vessels around South Africa's Cape of Good Hope to avoid the long wait, uh, at, which at least adds uh, seven days, depending on the vessel size and speed, to avoid uh, on average for to, um, between Asia and Europe. So uh, car, um, you know, car makers rely on just in time delivery and they had to turn to air uh, freight, freight to, uh, of parts as an emergency issue. So if you think about all the time it takes uh, to reroute your vessel around South Africa's uh, Cape of Good Hope, and if you think about the insurance cost and also today uh, with the um, with uh, um, with the piracy going around it almost adds half a million dollar uh, to the cost uh, of the vessels so security concerns of course increase as more ships traveled to the high risk waters of east africa so if you look at the 12 million tons of goods blocked in the Suez Canal, uh, so most of it was containers, uh, around 31%, uh, closely followed by the crude oil and uh, then other types of uh, cargoes. 
And uh, when we talk, talk about containers, uh, the, we, we today, because we always read about uh, COVID, we think about the vaccinate, vaccines that are held up. But uh, we have to remember, even the coffee, as I mentioned earlier, or the beer or autocompons, everything are today trans it, uh, transferred from one or different parts of the world. So uh, this delay, of course, had an effect on everything. So delayed shipping containers arrive at um, their destination and then adding uh, to the supply chain pressures. Remember, when a ship is delayed, then when it arrives at port, it has to wait for port to be cleared to keep their discharging or uh, loading operations. So if you look at the disruption of level the shipping had to face after the Suez Canal incident, uh, you, can, uh, you can see from this slide, especially in Singapore where it's a big hub, uh, it started imme uh, increasing uh, immediately like in Antwerp, Rotterdam and New York area. So uh, this is again to look at uh, what has happened to the container freight rates uh, since the since October 20 and uh, most of this increase had occurred because uh, the container lines had taken out uh, excess um, uh, containers because of expectations of uh, de uh, demanding containers which resulted in uh, shipping is a supply demand economy so when you have uh, less vessels or less containers available uh, then uh, when I and by the way when I talk about containers I'm actually talking about the, the containers not the container vessels so uh, today the problem is they took the containers off the market and now they're buying more or putting them back into the system well I would like to uh, thank you very much and pass it to uh, Professor Chadley and I think uh, as with Evergreen, we only notice the problems afterwards. So, uh, Professor. Sorry, thank you, Bashak. I was just uh, un unmuting myself. And I was, I was just sitting thinking about it. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, when you, you see that particular graph that was shown about, you know, the goods that were delayed not not perhaps only in the in the sewers but perhaps you know over the past uh, uh 12 months of the pandemic and uh Bashak knows this my my hobby and what's very important to me is is cycling and in the uk at the mi minute you cannot purchase a high-end uh bicycle uh you cannot get them in the country and they're, they're still if you order a bike now a particular one it's sort of six months away so it's amazing when you look at um, uh, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's the sewers, the sort of delays that can actually be caused on everyday goods that we take for granted. And I think that is the issue. We take so many things for granted in the society that we now live in. And I think that just relates. I'm just going to talk only literally for a few minutes, but a, a little bit about MLA, MLA College and how we fit in. Well, I, I think Sustainability is, is mentioned a lot. Uh, sustainability has been at the heart of what MLA College has delivered since we started delivering our distance learning degrees about uh, uh, six years ago. Because we all have a role. In fact, we don't just have a role, we have a duty for our next generation, for our children, my children, to behave in a sustainable way. Um, and as, as we've got there in that uh, middle comment, you know, promote the conservation and sustainable use of the environment for the advancement of the global community. And to, for the benefit of humanity actually moving forward. So um, particularly when we're talking about shipping, there are now various regulations looking to, um, sorry, if we can stay with the previous slide, Bashak, just for a moment. Um, if we're, if we're looking to the future, you know, IMO are putting various things in on uh, uh, pollution, on emissions, but are we moving quick enough as a society? Are we content with what we've got? I don't know. Those are questions we have to ask ourselves. And 
we can get diverted down one route. I was actually speaking with uh, one of our expert advisors yesterday. And really going forward, we're obsessed now with electric vehicles, et cetera. And that's, that's impossible to translate into something like the large container ships, you know, that you're actually seeing. And, you know, is battery technology, is it sustainable? Are we exploiting the use of rare minerals and even child labor within the mines of uh, producing that material just for us to be able to say we're being sustainable and green? Again, difficult questions to ask yourself. But we certainly think in the marine and maritime world, the future has to be around the use of hydrogen uh, moving forward. So we're committed to delivering that outstanding flexible education and training uh, to promote sustainability. And like I say, that is at the heart of what we do. Okay, Bashak, the next slide, please. So we provide distance learning programs and we have done that for six years. We are not a, a university that has had to react uh, to COVID and put things online. Um, we're, we're very much design all of our programs in a distance learning context, which you have to do. You can't just take programs, degree programs and put them online. The, as you will have seen uh, across the globe, you know, students to a certain extent are not happy with the offer that they're getting from a traditional approach and it doesn't work. You have to design everything uh, from the delivery material for the assessment for distance learning. And, and I would like to say distance learning is actually sustainable. We, we very much aim more at the professional. We're, we're broadening that. But to be able to undertake uh, distance learning to develop your career um, uh, and not have to attend somewhere or fly somewhere for two or three years to undertake that program and back is, is very sustainable. We deliver bachelor's and master's programs um, and our, in fact, our, our uh, total platform that we deliver our distance learning actually uh, is an award-winning um, uh, platform. Um, we use, we're very different. We use a diverse um, amount of associate lectures. By that, what do I mean? We have a small core staff um, and so we don't have to rely on an academic to deliver everything. We have associate lectures across um, the, the broad range of, of maritime and shipping. So if you wanted to do something in um, on a master's degree around the use of hydrogen in future propulsion, we have someone for that. If you wanted to do something that was looking at pollution, we have someone uh, for that. So we have that broad expertise. And I think that gives us a unique um, selling point with, within the higher education uh, industry. So, okay, Bashak, please, thanks. So just to say our commitment we've got there, I've actually talked about what those three are, but we're trying to promote that. We, we are in a position where we can offer bursaries uh, to individuals to assist them uh, if required to undertake our programs. We, uh, at the heart of what we do is equality and diversity. And in the maritime world, we all know that uh, gender equality is, is, is far not where it should be. You know, we have a very few uh, women into uh, maritime and shipping. So in actual fact, we, we started earlier this year where we have a woman into maritime bursary, where we give 500 pound off all, all programs to that. And we have seen, uh, we now have for our new intake that is actually starting uh, next week, uh, we are now up to about, um, I think it's about 16% of females who have rented our programs uh, because of our Women Into Maritime initiative. And we're key to actually uh, want to sort of push that and what we can do. But ultimately, we're about assisting all individuals across the globe. We are a global education provider. We happen to be based in the UK, but through our distance learning, we can deliver globally. So with what uh, Bashak has, has talked about, we hope through our sustainable approach and, for instance, our Masters in Sustainable Maritime Operations, we can raise the awareness of this. We can make people think about this and hopefully make the, uh, our world a, a more sustainable place to, to live in. So thank you very much. I think Bashak and I are now open to uh, questions, but I'll, Chris, back to you. Thank you. 
Yeah, th thank you, John, and thank you, Bash Bashak. I mean, very interesting, and um, I'm, I'm sure you know food for thought for you know everybody who's um, you know on this webinar um, and and more because you know we um, we need to spread the word uh, in relation to how um, you know sustainable development goals in relation to maritime how we actually contribute to those and, and what are the sustainable development goals for maritime i mean what, what what does maritime have to do to actually you know embrace um, and deliver sustainable development goals i think that's a that's a big question as well and um, you know we we see um, you know various countries coming up with their green agendas and their 10 point plans um, you know boris johnson has come up with uk's 10 point plan and you know, uh, quite a bit of it uh, revolves around uh, travel and and um, and trade and and you know, you know, you know, how we're going to fly less um, and some companies have already started to move in that direction uh, you know, i saw in the news just the other day that hsbc um, in terms of their global networks um, are going to reduce the number of flights that their employees uh, will take so you know that's a that's an area that you know, other companies i'm sure will follow um, i think it also begs the question about um, um, air freight, you know, is, is it more economical and more green um, to ship products uh, through maritime than it is through um, uh, air freight? And, um, you know, if the airline companies um, you know, have to reduce their carbon footprint, then, you know, there may be a, you know, a, a benefit there for, for maritime. You know, they'll be shipping even more products around the world. Um, and consumption you know, will be another issue. Um, you know how people adapt to you know the the new normal. Will we be consuming as as, as 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 many things that we've consumed before, or will we be eat, eating more healthily? Um, will we be using you know more renewable uh, packaging? You know all these issues that are on the table, and it's um, you know we, we remain to see how you know companies and uh, civil society will uh, adapt and embrace. Um, you know, these um, sustainable issues that um, we, we have to deal with. Um, as, you know, as far as MLA College is concerned, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, anybody listening that's, you know, in a company, um, whether it be in Turkey or UK, um, you know, there's something in your company that will be shipped by Maritime. You know, there'll be some goods, there'll be some services, there'll be, you know, there'll be some um, technology that, um, as Bashak identified earlier, that um, you know is, is is coming through a supply chain that is basically maritime. So you know, you're going to have to think about what you do in terms of um, your 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 sustainable goals in relation to to to, uh, to maritime and and, um, and and shipping. So um, I, mean, I think we start. With students, I mean, you've got to educate people to understand exactly what um, you know the um, you know the sustainability in, in maritime is all about, um, um, and and also for employees who are um, you know if you're in a company that uh, is a shipper, um, if you're you know, a broker or you, you're 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 dealing with even construction um, of, of shipping, you know you, you're going to have to think about how you build in. Um, you know, green architecture and, and, and green efficiency into your into the new generation of, uh, of ships, and um, you know MLA College are providing a program now where you know your employees and and students coming into your companies um, will actually uh, be taught uh, how they can deal with this and, and will be well prepared. So, um, I mean, this old adage of uh, educate to employ. Now, it's not just about educate to employ, it's about educate to employ and be relevant um, with, with um, you know, what will happen to the 21st century and beyond. So, um, you know, there's lots of opportunity that MLA College will be providing. And, um, you know, I would uh, recommend all of you to, um, you know, look at the website and see what's available. Um, and in particularly this bursary that's offered to women to get, uh, attract more women into, um, in, 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 into maritime, um, because as I say, uh, technology and artificial intelligence will all feature very strongly um, in, in, in whatever 
you know, organization we're in, but uh, particularly when it comes to, um, uh, to shipping. And um, as John said, uh, hydrogen is, is going to be the preferred uh, route for you know, the, um, uh, the bigger tra uh, cargo transport. So, um, yeah, I mean, the opportunity, the platform is already there. It's a question of um, uh, getting on board with it and um, moving it forward. So, you know, we want to see, um, you know, lots of inquiries coming through BCCT and or directly through to MLA College, uh, you know, following this. And we will be updating this as we go along because, um, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, program of development and uh, education. Um, to a point where you know, we, uh, we all fully understand uh, what we have to do, not what we'd like to do. Um, and um, uh, again, actions speak louder than words. So uh, yeah, um, we're getting into questions now. We've had a question I, I saw earlier, which was an interesting one relating to Turkey um, about um, you know, the, um, the, uh, the Bosporus and, and the Canal project. I know it's a bit political. I don't know if anyone who wants to make a comment on that, but um, it, it's... Uh, uh, it's an interesting question. <laughs> well, uh, the new Canal Istanbul project, uh, it has, of course, legal implications, which I cannot comment because, you know, as per uh, the, the, the Bosphorus is not like the Suez Canal. It's a Suez Canal is man made and Bosphorus is natural. And there is a Montreux agreement, uh, you know, which it is guided by. So there are certain rules and regulations. Uh, but then uh, there is another part to it. Of course, Istanbul is a city with 17 million people. And yes, it has dangers of uh, vessels. Uh, it, it does uh, cause uh, certain dangers. So I think we'll just um, have to wait and see what will happen. So uh, it is true that it is very dangerous to have 200,000 tons of um, oil passing through your window. But uh, I... I I am not sure how this uh, project will take place. Yeah, th th thanks, Mashek. Very diplomatic. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I think you know all, all these um, um, waterways that uh, you know currently service uh, our, our shipping. Um, there's, there's going to be a lot of rethinking on on you know whether they're still fit for purpose or not fit for purpose. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think from the information I receive, and I'm not you know, an expert by any means, but, um, um, you know, I am interested in trade and um, how we move, you know, goods and, uh, goods and products around the world. So um, if, 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 you know, if, if, if waterways have to cope with a different type of, of vessel, um, you know, you're going to have to adapt the waterways as well. Um, and um, you know, it, 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 it's a bit like having green cars or electric cars, as, as my son pointed out, who's uh, studying sustainability and international relations. Um, he said it's okay having a green a, a green car that's electric. He said, but um, the the car still got to be produced, um, and and you know the the, <laughs> the infrastructure of the rest of the car is not necessarily that green. So, um, yeah, you know, all these things have got to be thought about. And um, as I say, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, we're not going to answer all those questions today. But um, yeah, Chris, I think there'll be a lot of things that we've got to adapt to. Chris, can I just come in? And I'm not, I'm not relating it to the uh, Bosphorus or the canal specifically. But of course, um, sometimes we're looking at perhaps, again, what, what is potentially seen as required now. But of course, you know, we're, we're all looking at, we're all talking about autonomous shipping. You know, how are we going to feel with autonomous ships in these restricted waterways? What will happen? You know, will you be able to have autonomous ships? Will they have to have pilots, whether they're going through a canal or, you know, through the Bosphorus? We've got a classic situation here in, in the UK. In, in Plymouth, we had the Mayflower 400 project. So the Mayflower 400 project is about... Um, commemorating the sailing of the, uh, the Mayflower vessel to, um, to America uh, for the pilgrims. And um, as part of the Mayflower 400 project, 
uh, various parties in in uh, in Plymouth uh, built an autonomous vessel with a view that it was going to set sail this year to America. The Maritime and Coast Guard Agency uh, in the UK have now said they will not allow it to set sail from Plymouth in the territorial territorial waters, uh, so out to twelve miles. So if uh, you want to sail the autonomous vessel from Plymouth to Plymouth, which was the intention, it will have to be towed out of Plymouth in the UK until it's 12 miles offshore before it can start in an autonomous. So, you know, there's so much in this jigsaw that we actually keep talking about uh, in what we're looking at. So, yeah, there, there are no easy questions, you know, for even for sustainability we have to look at our rules and regulations uh, that we actually operate under as well. So I just wanted to say that as a, you know, we, we, we can concentrate on independent, on, on small things, a bit like your car analogy. And it's a little bit that I was alluding to, you know, it's oh great, I've got an electric car, but you know, you've still got a plastic dash, you've still got a battery with rare metals that was possibly, as I said, mined by, you know, uh, children or whatever. It's, it's all that kind of thing, you know, just because you feel good doesn't actually mean it's sustainable from a global context. So we have to take an holistic view to uh, sustainability. Oh, absolutely, John. And, and um, yeah, I think this is where, you know, you, you've got to bring governments. I mean, it's, it's okay for governments to you know, say all the nice words and, 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 and write plans as what they're, what they're gonna do, but, um, yeah, you know, unless they've got you know the 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 systems and the rules regulations in place that actually support those initiatives, as you you know described, then you know things are not going to move very quickly. And um, yeah, I think uh, this is why we have to push governments to make sure that um, you know they they are on top of this and, and not um, you know just uh, uh, window dressing uh, when it comes to uh, sustainability and, and, and climate change but um, as I say I think um, you know the uh, the pressure is is, is definitely growing um, you know the the um, climate change environments and, and um, green issues green ethics green finance call it what you will um, you know is very quickly moving up the agenda so um, you know, governments will have to react uh, positively to all this and make sure that uh, they're in step with, um, you know, with uh, what's going on in, 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 in the thinking of civil society, because more and more people, and particularly young people, are more, far more conscious of, um, of, of the future and, um, you know, how they will live their lives and how their children live their lives than probably, you know, m my generation or, or, or or my, my uh, son's generation, but definitely my, my grandson's generation will definitely have a, <laughs> a very different perspective on, uh, on what they want for the future. So um, yeah, anyway, we're, we're, we're digressing a little bit. Um, I'm just looking, do we, do we have any, any other questions in there? In Q&A, no open questions. Okay. Um, can I just go out to our participants and, and just ask them to raise a hand or um, submit a question, even if it's a, a detailed question, we can always take it offline. Okay. Well, we've got no more questions. Uh, Daruba, do we still have some time yeah we have some time for q a session okay but we don't seem to be getting any we would be welcome yeah okay not to worry um okay well um as i say we we're, we will be chatting for a while yet um because we do have you know, how well, here we go um how do you assess the reputation loss claim of of the sca Anybody want to answer that, Bashak?
Bashak, are you there? I'm here. Right, I'm saying, how do we assess the reputation loss claim of the SCA? I'm not quite sure what... I am not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, we're getting a bit more clarity on the SCA authority. Yeah, this said they will claim 900 million US dollars from ship owners. Oh, we are talking about, sorry, uh, ever given. Yes, uh, well, um, I have two opinions on that. So as you know, ever given is owned by one of the most reputable Japanese ship owning companies. And I believe, well, if it was a ship owner, they might have probably have left the vessel there. But uh, yes, uh, the, and they are claiming right now $900 million from the ship owners. And uh, of course, their lawyers have reacted. And uh, one third of this, uh, which, uh, which Egyptian government is claiming, which is $300 million, that's on um, loss of reputation. So I think... Um, I'm afraid to say in most of these cases, it's always the ship owners that lose because they have an asset lying there until so until this is sold, the vessel cannot trade. Uh, but uh, my strong belief is uh, it will be sold, but I am sure it will not be sold at nine million dollars. Uh, I'm sure it will come down. But at, but unfortunately, as we all know, uh, that. Um, every day uh, that the ship is not working is a loss for the owners and its operators. Okay, thanks, thanks, Bashak. And, and we have um, you know, a study from uh, Selim Bey on, um, if, if I'm reading this correctly, on the Istanbul um, Canal, a detailed study, um, a legal study. He said he, he's got um, a report available um, if he wishes to share it. Um, so, um, uh, Salim, if you, if you could send the report to um, BCCT, to Dilruba, um, we, we, we can then um, uh, share it with, um, with the people that have participated and our members also. Thank you. Uh, Ross Kelly has a question as well, Chris, in the Q&A. Yeah, fire away. You want to take it, John? Uh, no, because it will come back to yourself and Bashak. But how does Turkey's need to produce and export more for its economy work in all of this? Can you repeat the question? Because I do not see it. Yeah, Sorry. how does Turkey's need to produce and export more for its economy work in all this? Um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that one a shot. Um, yeah, I mean, Turkey, you know, is a big exporter. I mean, you know, UK is um, Turkey's um, second largest export market. And, um, you know, the, you know, the Turkey's biggest uh, export market is, um, is, is Germany and uh, the, the EU more generally. Um, and, you know, Turkey's got a massive manufacturing base. Um, and, it, you know, it's now developing new technologies and, um, moving up the value chain when it comes to um, you know, technology. So um, it's definitely on track to produce and export more, and that's critical for its, um, its future economy. And, um, you know, it's, um, as I say, the, 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 the fundamentals are there. Um, I mean, you have a country with 80 plus million people, of which, you know, half the population is under 30. So they've got a, a very dynamic demographic. And um, you know they've got a very um, well-educated and, and 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 large workforce who um, you know are, are definitely uh, very conscious of um, increasing um, uh, Turkey's export markets. And um, as I say, um, the signing of, of um, the FTA with the UK um, at the end of December was a clear indication that uh, UK and Turkey um, won't want to do more. Export. I mean, the, uh, I won't bore you with the detail of the FTA, but um, one of the key elements of the FTA was a, an agreement that, um, um, you know, within the next two years, 
um, the UK government and the Turkish government would negotiate um, an enhanced free trade agreement uh, between the two countries. So the free trade agreement that we currently have is a continuity agreement. You know, it, it, it just um, ensures and retains you know, the, um, um, uh, the trade relationship that we previously had, but there is a commitment to negotiate um, an improved and enhanced uh, free trade agreement between UK and Turkey. So um, the motivation is there, there's no doubt about that. And um, as Turkey you know, develops its, 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 its technology, um, particularly in, in manufacturing, um, as, as it moves into you know, more, um, uh, what can I say, branded products, um, and we're seeing more Turkish branded products now having a global presence. So. Um, in, in terms of its, you know, how does it relate to the subject we're dealing with today? Um, I mean, a lot of goods from Turkey to UK uh, does go by um, uh, by shipping. Um, um, also, a lot of it goes by road. Um, but you know, as, as the relationship between, let's say, um, Europe and the EU and the UK, as we get more um, sectors that we can access bilaterally, um, then obviously there's going to be uh, more, more, more business uh, transiting uh, between uh, UK and Turkey and Turkey and UK. Um, so uh, the other area that I think you know, uh, will be high on the agenda is Turkey's um, customs union agreement with the EU. And there's you know, a lot of uh, discussions going on at the moment um, to try and modernize uh, Turkey's um, customs union agreement with the EU. So you know, this all comes back to, you know, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but um, you know, I think um, you know, the will is there to, um, to achieve this because it's in the best interest of both the EU and Turkey to have a modernized um, customs union agreement. I mean, the numbers that I saw um, represented, I think, the benefit to, to Turkey um, if they signed a modernized agreement that opened up more sectors would be somewhere in the region of almost 2% increase to Turkey's GDP. So that's a, a large amount of money. And yeah, the benefit to, um, uh, to the EU was something in a, a similar region, about 1.5% of uh, the use GDP if they enhance the agreement based on the uh, on the sectors that they they want to introduce. So, um, you know, getting the goods there uh, efficiently and effectively, you know, are going to be critical. So, if um, you know, you've um, your know, supply chains have to be uh, efficient, and um, you know, they have to be affordable, and they have to be sustainable. So, um, you know, in in relation to Turkey. Uh, the quicker Turkey embraces, um, you know, this, uh, you know, these sustainable development goals in terms of its supply chain, then, um, you know, that will that will benefit everybody. It will also attract attract a lot of um, um, yeah, support from the EU as well. Long winded, but I hope that answers the question. <laughs> right, dear Chris, who's that? Who, who calls me dear? I don't know. Um, as the USA is starting to step back from the role of looking after the whole world's affairs, what will be the impact on the navvies, navvies of individual countries? N navvies meaning? Na navies. Navies. Chris, Chris <laughs> I, I would just, I mean, that's almost impossible to answer, isn't it? But just one thing in, in our row around sustainability. We are, I'm not going to say which, but we are involved working in the Navy where we're actually embedding uh, degrees actually within their education and training and within that degree of course sustainability remains at the heart so I think even even navies are aware of sustainability actually moving forward so as I say MLA College are, are, are working with a with an overseas navy where we are actually embedding uh, a degree within within their uh, education and training so I hope I, th I think all navies are actually looking at that and around sustainability but but that question about the US stepping back, no, I, I, I can't answer that. That's uh, too political for me. But I don't know if Basha wants to add no. But I do think 
you know, it's interesting that this particular Navy we're working with are very keen on the sort of sustainability pathways we actually have within our, our degrees, as well as the normal pathways you would expect. Okay. Do we have any more? Well, Selim Bay's you know, a comment more than a question. I think Turkey and UK should announce each other as strategic economic partners since Brexit applied on both countries. As, you know, they should do it as soon as possible uh, for their economic future and security. I mean, um, that's accepted. And um, I mean, it, it's, um, it's something now that is the, you know, is um, embedded in in the new free trade agreement. So, you know, that, uh, you know, we are looking for sustainability in that trading relationship. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, you know, the UK government does see Turkey as a strategic partner uh, that hasn't changed. Um, so, um, you know, that, that, will, that will continue to move forward. Okay, have we got any more? What's this one? I haven't seen that. I think we've, have we just about covered all those? I think so. Right. Um, well, if there's no more questions, um, you know, we've gone beyond three o'clock, which is um, always good to see. Um, as I say, that Q&A is still showing up as, as a red one. I don't know why that is. I don't want anybody to feel that um, they've not had the right attention. No, it's still that, I think it's Ross, Ross Kelly's uh, question. Okay, fine. Good. Well, um, as I say, um, you know, very interesting, a broad subject and, and difficult to you know, um, give people concrete answers in, in, in the space of time. Well, not in the space of time we've got. I mean, we don't have a lot of the answers. Um, we're on a journey. And um, you know this journey is going to you know, present certain obstacles, but um, at the end of the day, you know where there's a will, there's a way, and um, you know we will uh, you know use our scientists and our educationalists and you know our, our experts to you know, guide us in the right direction. And this is what this seminar has been been all about. Uh, but we will be engaging with um, with MLA College um, as we go forward on. Uh, more webinars and um, as I say um, just have a look at their website and see what's on offer um, for the uh, distance learning programs because that is going to be part of the future also uh, people will want more flexibility in their education okay um, I'm, I'm going to ask Bajak and John to stay on along with um, with Yoruba but we're actually going to uh, close the, um, the broadcast now thank you very much stay safe and take care.